Don't you think that? Could you, could you stand up, please? Uh, no. All right. Um, don't you think we should listen to our lady's request at Fatima, and there will be peace in the world if the consecration is done properly, if we do the five first Saturdays, and we are still the and all the prayer to that too, there are people coming into the church by their throngs, and you know, with the dumbing down of doctrine and the mass changing into the vernacular, which is all we get more people in, it really hasn't. But, well, certainly on your last point, no, whatever, whatever great plan uh, that people in the 1960s and early 70s uh, in the church had of thinking, hey, let's sort of dummy down the mass and then dummies outside of the church will be able to come in and somehow relate to it, uh, didn't work. <laughs> You're right. Um, with regard to, this is, again, something of what I was talking about at the beginning, uh, you know, we the laity, aside from prayer, uh, really can't do anything about Our Lady's request at Fatima. We, we can pray, we can write letters to bishops and everything else, but again, the church is organized in such a way that the bishops are the ones who run it. And it's the bishops and the pope, and the bishops in union with the pope, who have to do this. So, uh, should it be done? Sure, it should be done, but again, aside from praying, and I'm not diminishing prayer, I'm saying, what can the laity do? There are so many things in the church, and to this lady's point here about the, uh, you know, the dissent. That dissent, yes, there were many lay theologians who were involved in the dissent against Humani Vitae, but that was organized by the clergy. There was the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Statement in Canada, that was the entire Bishops' Conference of Canada, almost, almost to a man unanimous in saying no to Humani Vitae, who was the inspiration inside that Bishops' Conference, a priest by the name of Father Gregory Baum. The church is organized in such a way so that the laity are, you know, our own Cardinal Newman uh, was asked once, uh, after he'd become cardinal in the church, what do, you, uh, what do you think of the laity? And he said, well, we'd look pretty silly without them, wouldn't we? And a typical Newman answer, but uh, yes, I agree with all that, but in the meantime, and here's my problem with all of these sorts of things, in the meantime, when the constant battles are going over and the articles are being written, was Russia consecrated, was it not, all these things are going on, we aren't having conversations with people, because there's only 24 hours in a day, we aren't having conversations with people about what the church teaches with regard to this, why we shouldn't be involved in false ecumenism, why the Protestant heresy is still a heresy. All of these kinds of things that can be of benefit. I mean, the last thing you're going to want to talk to, to somebody who's trying to discern whether they should become a Catholic or not, is about Our Lady at Fatima. They need to hear, and I'm not dismissing Our Lady of Fatima, I've consecrated myself to the Blessed Virgin. So don't blow me off as like, oh, that's ridiculous. I'm talking about when you're having real conversations with people who want to understand why do I have to tell my sins to a priest? Why do I want to come into a church that is full of homosexual priests that abuse young boys? This is where people out there, where the glory of the church is not being told on a very basic, apologetic, catechetical level, the truth of the church the magisterial teachings of the church, the dogmas, the breathings of the Holy Spirit are not being communicated in the least. And if we know them, we need to be saying them. And we need to go up to Father after Mass and say, Father, why did you say that? That's wrong. Here's the catechism. And you need to write a letter to the bishop and say, no, that's wrong. We need to get out of parishes and stop putting money in the, ba in the baskets and the collection plates of parishes that support a, a watered-down dissident church. Our Lord is pruning this church away. 
I mean, we don't really need much of a strategy. Those people who are faithful are simply going to outnumber the ones who aren't in 50 years anyway because they will have all lost the faith. The church in Europe will be 5,000 people over the entire continent, and they'll all be faithful. But we cannot concern ourselves as lay people. That's what I'm talking about. We cannot concern ourselves as lay people about things that bishops should do, shouldn't do, this, that, or the other. We have to understand what's happening. We need to be able to know that so we can put in context what's going on so that when people come up to you and say, you know, I have 14 children and only one of them practices the faith. That person doesn't understand. That they have no frame of reference. We need to be able to talk to those people and say this is the case. We need to be able to give them information to go back and talk to their children. This, that, this is Holy Communion. This is grace. This is sanctifying grace. This is being in a state of mortal sin. Hell does exist. We need to do all of these things. And there's so much argument in the church among laity over things that we have nothing, we don't have any input into it because it's not our role. Our lady did not say to the laity, consecrate Russia to my immaculate heart. She said the Pope, in union with the bishops of the world, had to do this. And here's the problem with this, sir, I'm sorry, but I see so much attention on these things. And there's only 24 hours in a day. And what do they do? It inspires a kind of uh, almost fake mysticism, not Fatima per se. But what do you have now? You have this Maria of Divine Mercy garbage floating all over the church. Because she said, because she said that Pope Francis is the false prophet of the book of Revelation. Because she said, because she said that she's the seventh angel of the book of Revelation. So this is the concern. This is the concern that when the church, when the beauty of the church is not being effectively communicated and people want the truth because they are built for the truth, they go out and they look for it any place they can find it. And they find it in these ridiculous things like Maria of Divine Mercy and this mystic over there and that mystic over there. Stick with the magisterial teachings of the church, period. Yeah, when I'm talking about the laity doing something, I'm not talking about us trying to reform the bishops. That isn't possible. The way this structure, there is no mechanism by which the laity, at least currently in the church, uh, by which the laity have something in them. You can have private input to a particular cardinal or something, or maybe or give him a heads up that, hey, that guy that might be a bishop, you know, has done this or that, but I mean, aside from that, which most people don't do, what I'm talking about, don't have access to, what I'm talking about is on the lay person level, we need to know the faith. We need to be steeped in sacred scripture, as Father said. Let me give you an example. Everybody be honest. How many people here have read the Gospels, all four of them, front to back? So about half. When St. Jerome says ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ, how can we say we love Christ when we willfully choose to remain ignorant of him? Saints are what we are called to be. If we are saints, we will produce more saints. We will have saintly families. Saintly vocations will come from those families, as we see in the example of the Clovis family, not to hold you up and embarrass you, but, you know, you've got to say sometimes the way something is, right? Even if somebody's a little embarrassed by it, in a good way. Um, but uh, the laity needs to sort of regenerate the church, and not by, you know, report... Yes, if something's going wrong, sure, Rome needs to know about it. But once you've written your letter, you don't go back home and grouse about it for two years. We need to learn the faith. We need to understand the faith. 
We need to be able to, uh, if we can't do it in our parish because Father Liberal and Sister Mary pants suit wants to say, no, you faithful Catholics, shut up, sit down, be quiet. Well, then have it in your house. Start a prayer group in your house. Start a Catholic Bible study in your house. You know, the internet has changed everything. It is a whole new game. 25 years ago, we couldn't read these quotes that the Pope said. They weren't available anywhere. Unless you happen to speak Italian, you happen to be in Rome, and you happen to get a copy of Zerzori Romano, that was it. You know, how many Catholics who are so concerned about the church right now spend 10, 10 hours a day if they can, 20 hours, whatever it is a day, learning what's going on in the church, what's the faith, who can I talk to about it? When we go out on the street, when we sit in a restaurant, do we ask the waiter, are you Catholic? Have you ever thought about being Catholic? You know, do we talk to our family members? Or do we go try to find people who are open to the faith? This is how the church will survive. We are used to a mentality, and it worked for centuries, where you know, the, it was hierarchy. We were told. We did. This was before Nietzsche. Now Nietzsche's come along and proposed to the world an entirely different system. We need to go out into the world and propose to them the truth of, of the church. If that involves helping, you know, send off letters to bishops, say you're wrong on this and you're wrong on that, okay, fine, do that. But that's not the majority of our work. That's a tiny little fraction. Ours is about becoming saints, knowing, loving the faith, and communicating that to anybody we possibly can. If someone punches you in the teeth, will you move on to the next person? That's how the apostles did it. That's how the apostles did it. I hope so. Did you all hear what he said? Okay, it's a faulty microphone. Must be made in America. Um, uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland got invited to be the commencement speaker at Boston College in uh, Boston Jesuit University, and uh, nothing was said, and here he is, and then it was, was it last night? Okay, last night. Uh, Cardinal O'Malley, who sat in choir at Ted Kennedy's funeral in Boston a few years back, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, came out against the uh, appearance of the Prime Minister being the commencement speaker and also being given an honor. And the question is, is this something we could perhaps glean that this is Pope Francis perhaps picking up the phone and going, hey, Sean, this is Francis, say no. Uh, uh, I certainly hope so. I hope so, but uh, uh, you know, there's really just sort of no way to know that unless you happen to know the right people. But uh, I think that is a marvelous thing that Cardinal O'Malley has done, uh, and, and it needs to be yeah, absolutely. It will be the recapturing. It will be the recapturing, and we can say a thousand things to ten thousand people, and when a prince of the church or an archbishop comes out and says something, see how it emboldens you immediately? You're like, ah, a ray of sunshine, finally. So we can pray for this. We must pray for our bishops and priests. Remember, it was at the Last Supper, Satan, it's the only time in sacred scripture that Satan directly confronts God in the New Testament, directly confronts God, is at the Last Supper when he turns to Jesus, goes up to Jesus and says, I demand you give me those men, the apostles, the bishops, so I can sift them like wheat. And how do we know he said that? Because Jesus turned around and told Peter he said that. He said, and don't worry, Peter, I've prayed for you. Chill out. And when you're all back to your normal, strong self, you take care of your brothers. Satan has a particular hatred for bishops is why we must pray for them intensely. We should never offer up a rosary without the bishops being, intended, uh, being included in the intention. 
Right. Um, a lot of people here would have heard about the first Saturdays, obviously as an extension of Fatima, um, and would do them, and then we hear what you have said, which is uh, wonderful stuff. Um, how does the practical Catholic, like you said, with only um, 12 or hours a day, let's say, um, marry those two, taking into account that um, the church has said that it is true that if we do the first five, five, first five Saturdays, that this will bring, this will hope, this will bring a, be a great boon to bring about the bishops through the, the Pope doing the consecration. How does one marry those two um, definite um, actions? I, I, keep the microphone with him if you can for a second. So, what is the second action? I'm sorry, I missed that part. <laughs> the second action um, would be what you were proposing uh, we should do, i.e. Um, engaging the public. Because, I mean, obviously, practically speaking, one could, like, say, the convents or back in the old, old monasteries, spend 12 hours a day doing, um, say, uh, marrying devotions. Oh, but I have you. Okay, you I got you. I got you. The... The marvelous and curious thing about us, the way uh, our Heavenly Father created us, was that we are immaterial and material. And he has stuck us in a world that has immaterial and material uh, aspects to it. We have to relate to each. And uh, our individual call for each one of us is to be a saint. We can never lose sight of that. That is the very first thing we are called, and at the end of the day, really the only thing, we are called to be uh, as faithful Catholics. So how that sanctity is achieved or worked on or the sanctification process is that we must first be in a state of grace. And if we are in a state of grace and we die in that state, we're saints. That's what it means. If we die in a state of sanctifying grace, we're saints. Now, depending on who the individual is, you know, he or she may have to spend a, you know, a deal of time uh, in purgatory, but they're saved. So if we are in that state, we are saved in the here and now. Can we lose it? Sure. It's called mortal sin. But if we are in that state, then that state compels us to exercise our holiness both in the, I'm going to call it widely contemplative fashion, our prayer life, our devotional life, all of that, along with going out and talking to whoever we need to in the physical uh, dimension, the, the uh, apostolic work, if you wanted to call it. Man, that's a bad word because you can have a prayerful life of apostolic. The, the, the work of the physical world, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and that's largely determined by the person having come to a realization of what his or her gifts are, talents, strengths, weaknesses, kind of doing an inventory, spiritual inventory, and seeing what gifts has God given me, what gifts has God not given me, for the salvation of souls, period. Some people might be terrific writers, and they can write pamphlets or whatever, but all of this work has to flow from this. Because at the end of the day, it goes back to that. So we have to be always striving for holiness. And we all know how much we fail at that. We thank Jesus every day for confession, even though some of us may not be particularly fond of it <laughs> uh, on a human level. Uh, it's the work of saving souls comes from the desire to save our own souls. And it's not a selfish desire, it's that this is the natural order of the universe. God made us for him, for himself. So we're just trying to fulfill the natural order of things. Uh, on, a spirit, on a physical level, that's why we eat. We aren't created to starve to death, we're created to live, so we eat. On the spiritual level, we're created for eternity, so we move towards eternity, eternal life. And uh, so any work we're doing out in the physical world has to originate, flow from 
the interior life of holiness. All of the saints spent vast amounts of time in prayer, meditation, reflection, their individual devotional life, all of that. That is absolutely necessary. But it isn't, for most of us, it isn't only what we need to do. Some people are called to that. They're called to the contemplative religious life, uh, presence, you know, being in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament 10, 12 hours a day, and that is their particular calling. Uh, but for most of us, it is not that. Most of the laity uh, are out in the world, engaging the world, but we have to engage it from a position of holiness, faithfulness, ultimately love, and that becomes sort of the fuel that feeds the engine of doing the apostolic work. It has to be that way. Does that help?